For, um, October 17, 2017, I call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Trustee Kimmer? Present. Carbonero? Present. Daney? Here. Brenya? Here. Hopkins? Here. Ranky? Here. President Wallace? Here. First item we have in our committee meeting this evening is under Planning and Zoning Committee, uh, Chairman Hopkins. Thank you, President Wallace. We have one item under Planning and Zoning tonight. It's the Municipal Code Text Amendment update of Title III, Chapter 2, the Amplifier Regulations. And I think this is just some housekeeping issues um, to add in some times for the amplification permits. So do you want to go over any of it? Cliff Notes. Uh, yes, I think that that's exactly what it is. What Trustee Hopkins said, it avoids the really early ones, but there is some provisions for us to do those, but it sets some parameters for us to issue those amplifier permits. How well has that been working so far? Well, we've issued 44 to, to date since we had the administrative approval, so it's going pretty smoothly. We had one or two that were a little early, we got a couple calls on it, so that's why we decided to go to some of the hours. Any other questions from the committee? We'll forward this on to the village board for a vote. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That's all we have under planning and zoning tonight. Thank you, Chairman Hopkins. Next item we have our village uh, committee of the whole meeting this evening is Finance and Golf Committee, Chairman Janey. Thank you, Mr. President. The first thing we have is the renewal of our health insurance. <coughs> Our health insurance plan, and uh, I'm going to ask staff to give us the uh, the explanation and update on this. Thank you, Trustee Daney. Uh, <coughs> in 2014, the Village Board did an extensive review of uh, our insurance program with a with assistance from an outside consultant. We looked at um, self-funding insurance and pool insurance, and we evaluated that against our um, locally brokered, <coughs> fully funded program. Um, what we're presenting tonight is the annual um, renewal for that fully funded program. Um, as you know, this past August, we asked our broker to evaluate self-funding um, as an option, and we found that this type of plan was not feasible, nor was it cost-effective due to our claims experience. Um, Janelle sent you an, uh, a memo about that in August that kind of detailed some of our claim experience and why that's not uh, a viable option. Um, we continue to work with our local broker and evaluated other programs options such as a high deductible plan. Again, we found that this option did not provide a significant savings to the village, um, <clears throat> neither the village nor our, our employees. Um, the renewal plan that's outlined for you in your packet is a combination of structural changes, cost adjustments, and education to drive more efficient health care choices by our employees. We've been able to reduce the rate of, of the increase from 19.9% as first presented by our broker down to 158 and realize a potential annual savings of approximately $61,000. Uh, the biggest change in the plan is the move from a simple employee or family option to a four-tiered plan that allows our employees um, to choose what fits their family dynamic from uh, employee and spouse or employee and children. Um, this updates a 25-year-old structure that is out of date with the modern insurance market and is more reflective of the private sector selections and it provides flexibility and cost savings not only to the village but to our employees as well. Um, the next change is what I would uh, describe as behavior modifiers. Uh, the first is an increase in the emergency room copay from $50 to $150. Um, this change provides uh, dual benefits for cost savings. It lowers our overall rate um, in both plans, the PPO and the eight. Uh, HMO. And secondly, it is a behavior modifier for our employees seeking treatment. Um, it funnels them towards the urgent care facilities or their doctor's office rather than going to the emergency room. Now, sometimes if you fall and break your nose, you go in an ambulance and you go to the emergency room anyway, but in, in other cases, you have an option to decide where to go. Um, our employees that are involved, uh, enrolled in the PPO plan um, also will have the ability to participate in a WebMD program, which allows you to 
um, communicate with the doctor um, online rather than going to your doctor's office as well. So lots of options for seeking care that will result in behavior changes that results in financial savings for the village. Um, we have also uh, added an educational component to our plan this year with um, our HR staff and our broker doing some education at uh, open enrollment meetings, helping our employees to understand the changes to the plan and how to most effectively utilize the plan to save money for themselves and their families, with ultra with, which ultimately lowers the cost for the village. Um, this kind of education assistance program has not been offered to our employees in the past. And then finally, the prescription drug and copay reimbursement that is part of the police union contract expires uh, this April, and that will result in a $25,000 savings. Uh, our collective bargaining agreements outline the percentages of the coverages that the village and employees are responsible to pay. Um, the majority of our employees are in the um, union bargaining units and uh, therefore we looked at uh, finding changes to our program that provided savings and kept the um, kept our commitments to the union um, agreements and if you have any questions uh, Janelle is here to uh, answer any questions you might have I don't have any questions does anyone else have any Comments or questions? Or? This is one of the big, one of the largest expenses that the village occurs on a monthly and a yearly basis. Right. The health insurance, correct? Yes. So, what would be the process to look at other brokers? What would be that process? To look at other other brokers, programs, other brokers, yeah. other brokers. Um, I would imagine that we would need to um, go out to bid to look at other brokers. Now, the brokers that we have, um, the, the two, two largest that were in town have joined together, and that's who we have. Um, to go outside, um, uh, we would need to, we would probably be able to do that going forward. Um, I believe that there are some time requirements that we're up against. Um, federal time requirements and uh, Janelle, can you elaborate on that? A sure, bit? absolutely. So this year, um, under the regulations of the um, Amer uh, the Affordable Care Act, we have to have a plan in place in order to allow people a certain amount of time to choose a plan. And so at this juncture, we could not do that this year. If it's something that the board would be interested in doing in future years, we can certainly do that. Um, as I recall, and as Paula had stated, um, in 2014, I know um, the board was very interested in, in keeping um, a local broker, giving that local broker to the business, like our business. And so, um, and as she stated, the two largest brokers in the, in the village combined, because they were actually opposing when, at that time, and so they've combined and um, we're working with both of them now. So, but that is definitely something if the board directed us to do so, we could do so in the future, in future years. The, I don't think, a, I don't think shopping for a broker is going to necessarily save us money. It would on commissions possibly, but they're going to shop the same markets that are available to all brokers. And, with the changes in the Affordable Care Act, the marketplace for insurance has gone down. There's probably four large carriers that, that quote um, group business. And so if you're looking at maybe savings, that it's probably something that we need to do internally. And so that's what we're, we've committed to do. Looking at, evaluating our plan with our insurance broker, we're we're at, we're way over benchmark in terms of where we're at percentage wise in our claims experience. And that's a concern to us. And so that's why we've committed as staff to educate our employees and work with them to modify behaviors so that they can become better educated consumers. 
we have not done this in the past. And it's something that our broker said, hey, let's work on this together and educate them to, you know, change their behaviors. And the addition to the WebMD program on the PPO plan, this is something that's trending in a lot of other plans. And I think it's going to be a wonderful option for our employees. And we're going to educate them to utilize that so that we'll reduce our claims experience in those terms. Again, small change. We've been making small changes to change the behaviors, but I, th I believe going forward we can make even more drastic changes in behaviors by just educating our employees. And, and I also think what will really move the needle on our savings is um, modifying our claims experience because when we go out to shop, they look at you know they look at our employees, they look at our experience level, and that's what really nails in the the, the rate that they give you. So we need to do some work um, in in house on reducing those claims, doing some better education with the choices that our employees make in terms of. You know, do I go to Walgreens or do I do my prescriptions by mail, which save, saves us lots of money. You know, so there, there are lots of things that, that we can do as um, consumers and uh, lots of things that we can do as an organization to kind of modify that behavior that will put us in a better position if we do want to go out to bid. I think you just, we just modified uh, some of the controllables tonight with the uh, tree brush. Um, I mean, we just modified some of that as a board tonight because that was a lot of claims. But is that health claims or is that work? Health claims. Or is that worker well, well, Those would go to Irma, but, you know, they're injuries. And, you know, sometimes injuries have residual claims. So let me ask, uh, <clears throat> what is the savings that we're talking about? Is there the, the, the total amount that we can... Um, the total amount from from um, what we've got in front of us is sixty one thousand dollars. That's it's still going up fifteen percent. So right, right. I mean, the, yeah, it's fifteen percent, but with the the plan that we currently have, we're saving sixty sixty one thousand dollars. Okay. Actually, if I can speak to that, the plan is changing. Right. With the tier structure from a two tier to a four tier plan. So it is, the, the plan itself is changing somewhat to a degree. Um, what that means for the village, and again, it's hard to put an exact figure on the amount of savings that we're going to experience because I do believe by changing the structure of our plan, that is going to also. Some employees are going to migrate to different plans because it's going to be a, a better cost savings for them and in turn for us as well. So it's hard to put an exact figure on the amount of savings, but... Until you go through enrollment. Exactly. So I just want to clarify a couple of things. So you, our costs are going to increase 15.8% from what to what? I mean, we've talked a lot about savings, but I understand you're saving on the, the quote. So what is the increase? The 15.8%. The yeah. yeah. And so what's the dollar amount on that? Do we have that? I don't. Well, and if we need to talk about that at a future meeting, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I, I do think it's important. I mean, later on we're talking about a sales tax uh, here. And one of the things that we've been talking about, uh, some of us, you know, for four years was the unsustainable levels of, of the insurance premiums. You know, not to begrudge the staff, but, you know, at the same time, we're talking about a sales tax increase. So I think it's important to understand what we're paying now uh, per employee or family, however it's set up, and what that 15% increase is going to mean. Yeah, I agree. You too. I, I, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't have that for you. Janelle, may I ask another question? What it, it, or, uh, across the both public and private sector in HR, what is healthcare costs continue to rise? And so we're talking about 19% and 15%, but do, and you may not know this off the top of your head, but what are, what are the private sector and public sector increases that ha are expected Actually, in other areas? 
there was an article that came out that Todd shared with me and um, the actually it was Brian I'm sorry that Brian Grelsky shared with me and it was um, it's double digits across the state and and I'm I don't want to be disrespectful to the um, to the federal government but the Affordable Care Act did not work in terms of it, that's what's causing these increases and and they're looking at I mean they're looking at the fallback of that and unfortunately we're taking the brunt of that um, you know in, in group health insurance and that's both private and public sector um, double digits summer summer is high our broker said some of his clients are experiencing 30 percent increases in their insurance premiums and I mean when I when he first approached me with a 19.9 percent increase I my heart dropped into my stomach I because I agree with you all of you it's a huge expense and and we have to figure out a way to to combat that those increases I can't I it's it's unfathomable that someone who leaves our employment if they were to stay on our plan they're they're paying thousands of dollars for insurance there's they can't afford to retire because they can't afford the insurance premiums I mean it's just our, our but that goes to my point because I pay for my own insurance and when I get the renewal notice well actually what happens is the insurance I don't know if you're familiar with this but the, the, the company cancels the plan and gives you a new plan which is usually 20 to 30 percent more so I'm looking at twenty thousand dollars to insure my family cash that we pay so there's no you know taxpayers to pay for it it's something that we pay and by the way, my deductible is not $50 for an ER visit. It's six to $8,000 for my entire family. So, you know, th I think this is a very tough sell. And, and again, I know it's very personal um, and it's not meant that way. I don't, you know, disrespect anybody here, but this is a ton of money. Yeah. And, and there needs to be a sense of realism with what we're doing for, and that's part of the problem with the pension system too. You know, uh, we need to be realistic about, you know, benefits. Um, in light of the fact that, you know, our revenues aren't growing like that. I mean, our revenues aren't growing, you know, 15.8% this year. How, how can we afford to do this? And, and I don't think our employees take, take any of those comments personally what? as a personal what? attack or, or a kind of an us versus them. I mean, you have to understand, they, they've um, been with us every step of the way when we've reduced and reduced and reduced the plan, and they understand that. Um, it is it is something that uh, we talk about frequently. Um, I had a, a coffee meeting on Friday, and that was the main topic of discussion: um, was the insurance plan and what was what we were going to talk about here tonight. And they understand that they understand that um, the revenues aren't there, and they have to make to, you know they have to. There's going to be changes to the plans that are going to impact them. Um, and and they, they've understood that. They've understood that for the last several years that we've, you know, kind of made these incremental changes so it doesn't hit them all at once. Um, you know, our benefit package is a big part of our recruitment. So we have to be, you know, we want to be have an eye to that in, in, in line, you know. Um, that, that's something that we have to kind of keep in mind, especially in terms of the police department. Um, you know, we don't want to be um, a revolving door for, you know, hiring people, training people, and then they leave us because they get a better deal somewhere else. So um, those are all things that we take into consideration, and then um, we certainly take those comments to heart, all not my, personally. All of my experience has been that when I see companies or people that work for companies, they'll, their company will take that hit maybe for three, four years, and then just they have their the company or their broker or whoever will then switch to another insurance company. Has has that been looked at by the broker? Was that was that pursued? Other than just saying what kind of better rate can we get through Blue Cross Blue Shield? Was other companies looked at? There's only so many companies that are available in the state of Illinois because they've pulled out. Well, I know, but you still have United Health here. You have Aetna. You have. It's not here. When, huh? when, when the broker not does here. the. To answer your question, when the broker does the bid, he gets them from everywhere. Right. So United Healthcare, he compares them side by side. Our quote is through United Healthcare. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
we're going through the same thing at work. 15.8% is what we got from United Healthcare. And it wasn't available. Blue Cross Blue Shield's not available. So it, the pool is not uh, worthy of fishing in. There's only a couple of companies you can actually bid on. Uh, so I wanted to clarify whether or not that option had been pursued, just making sure that, that they just didn't say, well, let's see what we can negotiate with Blue Cross Blue Shield and, and other, other companies were just kind of left out in the cold. I didn't think that was the case, but I wanted to clarify. Every, every year our broker goes out to shop the market. He does, he, he, we're, we direct him to look at every possibility, absolutely. Okay, all right. And how do we, I know from, from my business that bringing on new people, insurance is very, as a benefit, is a very important, is, is very heartfelt important um, thing. How, how do we find out and, and, and understand what other communities, especially police departments, are offering so that we do enhance our um, retainment and also attracting new we, we look at those benefit plans every year on an annual basis during the same time of year, and we look at the plan design, the plan structure, what plans are offered. As a matter of fact, in the memo, um, we did look at a high deductible plan, and quite honestly, it, it, it didn't produce, I was shocked at, that it didn't produce the savings that I expected it would, it would potentially, so we didn't even put that as an option this year, but we look at plan design, co-pays, um, doctor visit co-pays, specialist visit co-pays, and things like that. And then um, we, we have made incremental changes in the past years. It's just a matter of we don't want to do too much at, at once, as Paula stated. But, but more to the point of your question, we look at our comparables. To other communities? comparable communities, yes. And how, and, and there they, those, no, those facts and figures are public record? Uh, Janelle, how do you do that? Actually, they are public record, um, <laughs> but I actually have a network of uh, professionals that I get, I receive their benefit plan design and their contribution percentages, and I look at all of that. Um, sometimes you're not comparing apples to apples, but again, yeah, that's all done. Um, I get, I'm able to get plan design documents from other communities, and that, yeah, they share that readily. I'm, we all do, so we can look at what others have to offer. In terms of um, our comparables right now, in terms of percentages, I know that a concern with the bo some members of the board was um, the percentage that our employees currently contribute to the premiums. And right now, um, some of our comparables have uh, an employee contrib contribution as low as 2%. Um, some are, three of them are at 10%, one is at 12%, one is at 15%, and then two are at 20%. Um, again, as Paula stated, the concern that we have is we have, we have two union contracts that we, that we have commitments to, and the majority of our employees are in both of those groups. And so by changing, making changes for the, the non-represented employees is not going to be it's not going to be a savings to us. It, we, it would be those two groups, and to try to negotiate that when other comparable communities are similar to what they have, that's where the problems you know, I was, come I was surprised to hear that the high deductible plans don't save, because in the, my patients, even those in, in, in the fanciest corporate buildings downtown Chicago are, are coming to the office with these really high deductibles. I don't know if you have the same thing. So I was surprised that you said that those didn't really flush out to show a, a genuine savings. Yes, I was, I was shocked. I was quite frankly shocked. I, I thought for sure that would be the answer, and it, it just was not for us. And, and I'm not questioning you, but frankly, I find that hard to believe. So, I mean, I would definitely like to hear from the broker directly. I was I just, just going to say it. that we can have, well, we can have Paul come. We didn't want to bog down with all, you know, the notebook of numbers, but we can certainly have Paul come and he can walk you through the numbers. We can all walk through the numbers. I, yeah, yeah. Um, well, and I don't think it. I don't think it's our role to micromanage either. I no, mean, but why, you want to. You want to be informed, and and that's I think probably the best way to do that. And you know, frankly, from a, 
not micromanaging, I would like to see that that 15.8 percent increase to be zero. And how you get there is, is up to you. I, I don't think we need to, to set the, the the cost for an ER visit. Um, I, I don't think that that's appropriate. But certainly, I, I would definitely like to see a, a number zero or closer to zero. I don't know if I can do that. Um... But we can certainly take another run at it, and we can bring Paul back to uh, uh, walk us through it and that analysis. When's the last time we've changed brokers? We have. We've had Paul for as long as I remember. Um, I think he's been with us for 22 years. I've been here 16 and a half, and he's been our broker since I've been here. Pretty much you're saying we're handcuffed this year we can't change brokers because of federal regulations um, I don't well I mean if we want to have a process are we we're, we've run out of time to do that um, but I will tell you that every time we've asked Paul to look at something he's done it and he's done it aggressively um, and we'll go back and we'll see what what else we can ring out yeah, I, I can tell you just from your absence before, um, Trustee Hopkins, we did do a pretty extensive um, with outside brokers other than him the last time we did it. So we did look at some other ones. But I think next year it would be a good, a good exercise to do it again. Yeah, and I also think we ought to look at, we ought to look at the pooling option. Um, you know, we've had some success with that with Irma and keeping our costs down, and um, we might want to look at that as well. I agree. Anything else? Yeah, one more thing. Following here. Janelle, you brought up the fact that we have comparables. Um, is there a, a column on that comparable that has the village revenue that we can compare their revenue to our revenue to see if we're comparing uh, like products? Because it would be kind of hard to compare us to Carroll Stream because we don't have a Joe Cotton Ford. So our revenues are a little bit lower. Now, they may have a 2% employee contribution. We can't afford that. Ours have to be a little higher. So are you asking what our comparables are, or are you asking to take and like, evaluate who we use as our comparables? On the comparables that we're using, let's also compare the revenues from those cities, villages. Yes. Comparables are based on a number of things, um, population, EAV, revenues, um, all of those factors come into play when we use comparables, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, moving on. So we're, gonna, we're expecting, uh, I guess, another little round of this information. Okay, good. I look forward to it. All right, the next item on our agenda is the potential general fund revenue discussion. And um, I guess, staff again, please give us a little input, Todd, I, I guess. I just wanted to um, introduce it a little bit. Uh, when we met with our, in our strategic planning session at the end of September, um, several of the trustees expressed that there was a great deal of confusion about the home rule sales tax that was being discussed um, in terms of um, what that percentage is that we're recommending and um, what other towns around us have that tax and they asked us um, that we make an effort to clarify that. Um, we did that in a, uh, a website and Facebook post that contained the information that was included in your board packet from the previous discussions. Um, at committee meetings on July 18th, August 15th, September 5th, and um, at those meetings the board discussed various revenue sources such as the food and beverage tax and uh, video gaming revenue and uh, various cuts to expenses as well uh, in the memos that were outlined from the police department and finance department. Um, the board also discussed wanting more information about pending items such as the waste hauling contract, the insurance renewal, and the continued fee review um, to get a, a fuller picture of both sides of the ledger as we move toward the start of budget season. 
Um, tonight we've started some, we've presented some of those. We're going to be doing the um, fees in a little bit. And I'm really grateful that um, we can have this continued discussion at the start of the budget process instead of during the board's review in the spring. Um, your input now will help us guide um, the budgeting decisions when the departments begin to put together their proposed budgets, and they'll be starting to do that in November. So um, I just wanted to, to preface that, you know, this is coming at the beginning of our budget process. Normally we're having this discussion in April and there's a clock ticking. Um, this does give you the, the, the um, uh, added um, space to consider um, and keep considering. Um, I just didn't want you to feel like you were pressured to make a decision tonight. This is an ongoing discussion that we're going to be having. Um, and it, like I said, it just uh, helps us put together the proposals. So with that, I'll let you have right it. On. Anybody have any comments? Or I think we went through this so many times. Um, I found it a little shocking that our population had decreased 4.69% since 08-09. That what did? The population decreased from 08 and 09, but decreased 4.69%. So, oh, it's the percentage per resident is what you've got here. Yes, yes. Yeah. So the percentage per, per thousand percentage. resident. Yes. That's the number. I was confusing you. You had that, that confused look on your face. Well, numbers often confuse me. So just to reiterate that, the number of employees per thousand residents is what we track because it takes into account the growth of the community and demand for services. And I've been talking about that for five years. Um, as a level, relatively level um, number of people. Since 2008-09, our number uh, has decreased by 4.69% employees to 1,000 residents. Yes. <clears throat> Go ahead. So our revenue is down $800,000. It's really 400,000 this year and next year because of the state cut kneeled LGDF, um, right? We're talking about 800. Yes, the 800,000 comes from uh, this year. We are using 400,000 of the fund balance. Okay. And then there's another 400,000 dollars that we're going to be short because the uh, when the state passed their budget, they reduced the income tax by 10 percent, 400,000. And that's that's this current year that we're in that we're going to be short. So we're going to end up about eight hundred thousand dollars we're going to use four hundred about eight hundred thousand dollars of fund balance in the fiscal year that we're currently in um and i note in your your memo august 28 2017 uh there's a reference to one hundred and six thousand dollars if we cut brush pickup so how how is the vote on the refuse contract going to change that are we now looking at 800 being 700 because of the refuse contract? Go ahead. Uh, the 100,000 or 106,000 is staff time that was dedicated towards brush. So we're planning to utilize them, those same staff members on the bike path maintenance, pavement patching, tree trimming, and that stuff. So there isn't really a savings as far as because those staff members will still be on board. They're just going to be doing other duties. Right. Yeah, I just, I, I can't believe if we're looking at trimming $800,000, the best we can come up with is flower, flower baskets. Uh, I, I don't know. Well, well this is before our, our, uh, our, our real dive into the proposed budgets coming forward. Those were just some things that I asked the um, staff to take off. You know, that's all the low-hanging fruit, really. 
Are any of these uh, items that are listed under the street departments, Dan, are they things that can be picked up with the motor fuel tax? I mean, we've got uh, bike path maintenance. I would think that obviously is uh, coming from motor fuel tax. I mean, I don't know if that changes anything or not, uh, but that's money that we have set aside, right? That's not something the state's taken away. They have delayed sometimes, but no, we've been getting the MFT funds now. Um, assuming that doesn't change, we would be able to do that. One thing on like bike path maintenance, I think as long as it's adjacent within the right of way and adjacent to a roadway, we can utilize it. I'm trying to find out on like the ComEd right of way whether it can be utilized for that or not. One thing I will note is the uh, roughly a million dollars we get per year is not enough to maintain the roads we currently have. So taking it and using it towards bike path is gonna make the road program less, which then we start having to catch up on roads again. Well, explain to me how we could have, let's say in theory, we could have paved a parking lot for $695,000 and we still could have done roads and everything else at the same time. I, I, there seems to be some discrepancy there. I don't, I don't quite get how we had the money to do a parking lot, but then we wouldn't if we... Uh... I'm, it's just a decision on whether you want to put the money towards a bike, uh, bike paths, parking lot, roads. I mean, those are pretty much the three things we can utilize it, the MFT funds on. And it was an item that was, I mean, Rizika has been talked about since I've been here several times about getting it cleaned up. But uh, I mean, we put that one the rest in, you know, so now we're, uh, as we get into the Capitol next month, uh, you'll see the road program being beefed up a little bit. And then based on the bike run committee, uh, hopefully increasing some of the bike path maintenance and focusing our attention on maintenance of our roads and bike paths. Are sidewalks and curb cuts part of that uh, motor fuel tax as well? You can that use it for well. that. So ADA ramps, all that stuff that is required, if we touch it, we have to make, meet the ADA requirements. That all goes towards that as well. Um, also in those memos, we looked at things that wouldn't, um, you know, we took your comments to heart regarding keeping the same level of service to our residents. So. Um, Flower baskets isn't really a service. Um, you know, we tried to look at those things that were aesthetic. We looked at holiday lights. We looked, you know, we really tried to look at things that would not um, diminish the service levels to the residents as well. That was kind of our guiding force in putting together that list. Is there any internal things that we can do to save money? Like, yeah, and I think we'll, we'll, I think we'll see those things when we bring the proposed budgets together. I mean, we hold positions open. We don't fill positions. We've, you know, we've taken them off the books. Um, there are certain, <clears throat> um, certainly more internal things that we can do. Well, I think uh, it's very important that uh, we're on the record as far as uh, what staff has done <clears throat> since 2007, what the police department has done already what's happened with our tax levy, and um, also we're aware of the, um, the, LG, uh, the LGDF, but uh, can you just, Paula, tell us, uh, the board, you know, since staff, the, when I looked at it, I'll let you speak. What's your question? Well, I, what has staff, we, the information I, I received is that since uh, 2007, uh, staff has been reduced by 5%, yes. which is uh, plus or minus about uh, 11 or 12 people. That's right. That That is a range. Um, there's somebody in every department. Um, it's police officers. It's maintenance workers. It's secretaries. Um, there's no department that's been spared from losing people. I think what I'm asking you is very, very important because, you know, so many people, you know, as Trustee Hopkins has said, is what else can staff do? But in my opinion, staff has been proactive in doing what they possibly can. 
And that's why I asked the question about 2007. Also, I understand that the uh, police department is currently down approximately two people. Is that correct? Pat, do you want to take that? In this current budget year, um, we were asked to not fill three positions. One was a police officer, one as an investigation secretary, and one as a records clerk. So um, actually, I think those three are, they, they were not funded for this budget year. Because I get to ask this question a lot. And, uh, and what about our tax levy? It stayed the same or it's less since 2012. Isn't that correct? Yes, our, our general fund tax levy is, has, has uh, remained the same or have been decreased over a number of years. So those are some of the occurrences that, that we've seen and we've experienced. It's not like, uh, you know, anyone's trying to go out and just arbitrarily you know, take advantage of anything. So, but I thought that was extremely important that uh, that question be answered because I've been asked that question a number of times. Would it be beneficial for um, for us to hire a consultant to look at each department? Um, I think I think um, one thing that I would would want to look closer at is um, using a consultant for um, building and um, community development and combining those departments. Um, I think there could be some merit. I know um, NIU does that work for a number of communities. They've done it um, recently. Um, I think that might be um, beneficial. Paula, is it is it is it my under, is my understanding correct that we we do not at this moment um, need to make the decision on a home rule tax? that we can try to manipulate the budget in the upcoming year in preparation of that 800,000. And, and with that said as well, for clarification, we as a board voted, I believe, to, um, to there was $188,000 that we did not spend on contracts for the police department. So does that, in essence, bring our $800,000 down to $620,000? Yes. I should ask. No, uh, that would be the next year, 18-19 uh, year. But that, would, that would say from uh, right now in the 17-18 year is the year that we're short. Uh, if we save any money, we end up not using that. Uh, that would be uh, the second year of the construction. So you're, so you're really looking for short-term savings then? The $800,000 is the current year that we're in, and I, I don't know that we're gonna be able to make those kind of savings for this current year. That's just what we're gonna be short, but that's where we're starting out the next year. That's, that's where we're starting off at is basically uh, what that's come from. Um, Jim and Danny, let's, let's I, wrap this up. Go ahead. Right. Where do you want to go with this? Um, we just want to probably go back I, to I understand. We'll, we'll bring back some of that information. Um, we'll look on, um, we'll continue this discussion through um, proposed budgets. It's not, uh, not a decision that you have to make at this time. And uh, we'll look at, at some of those uh, uh, deeper cuts. Well, and, and looking at 53% of our current budget is capital projects. Isn't there a way we can pare down? And I went back and I looked at the capital budget and it's, it's hard because I'm not an engineer, but isn't there a way we can pare something down that we can cut it into different pieces and, and drag it out? I know vehicle replacement, that's something that we always talk about. Instead of it being three or four years, maybe we can shoot it to five or six. I would like to say the capital budget is mainly being funded by the Illinois low interest loans, uh, things like that. Capital budget is not in the general fund. What we're focusing on is, is the general fund, and that's operations, and that's uh, police department, streets department, snow plowing, uh, general administration 
that's why we keep talking about the general fund levy. Uh, that's mainly operating expenses, not, not the capital outlay. Capital outlay is uh, the, the MFT program, uh, the water uh, infrastructure, uh, Lake Michigan water program. But all those things that you mentioned relative to the capital budget, we can certainly do. Um, you'll be seeing that in November. Um, so we'll be looking at, or December. Um, so we're looking at maybe some of that different phasing, and we'll keep that in mind when we start the review for that. Where does the money come from for vehicle replacement? Does it ultimately come from the general fund? Vehicle replacement, uh, it comes from the departments. It comes from water, sewer, and then the general fund. So if we change that, it's going to change the amount that we spend. Then we would reduce the annual contribution from the departments to the vehicle replacement fund if we can, if we can push those uh, purchases off. Okay. Yeah, but I think that's a, that's a good point because we're not talking about a couple of water and sewer department vehicles. We're talking about the bulk of the fleet is not from, it comes out of the general fund. It's paid by the general fund. Police vehicles come from the general fund. Right. Uh, inspectors, vehicles uh, from the general fund. Right. What's the current cycle for, not to get too much into the budget right now, but what's the current cycle for the police vehicles? The, the contribution from the police department uh, for vehicles is, is in the 200 something a year, 200,000 a year. the cycle of replacement so it it we used to do it based on the number of years and as we've seen issues with the budget creep up we've been trying to pay more attention to the actual mileage um, and the engine hours that are on those cars um, a lot of them do get used uh, some 24 hours a day and it's a lot of wear and tear on those vehicles so if we're not going to replace them we're probably gonna have to spend more on maintaining them um, but you know it all depends on how much mileage they have if they've been down for, for if they were involved in a crash or something, obviously they don't get driven as much. So then we want to hold on to them and, and increase the mileage on those. So it's not based on years anymore. It's more based on mileage, maintenance history. If there's major maintenance issues, um, then we seek to replace them. Have we ever seen municipalities our size um, have their own in-house mechanics for their police and public works vehicles? And we don't currently have that. Do you think that could be a cost we, savings for us? We currently have uh, one of the maintenance guys that does what he can, and then beyond that, then they outsource uh, the maintenance. So if it gets too sophisticated, then we farm it out. Um, I'm familiar. There's there's two ways of doing it: farming it out versus hiring your own mechanics and and doing it. There's Pluses and minuses with both. One of the things we talked about in strategic planning was um, joining forces, so to speak, with other public uh, services, other such as the park district or the fire department or things. Um, would a mechanic be something that, if we didn't have enough work, could be utilized as a shared service among other public uh, entities. Um, I know we have very clarity on what we need to do going forward, so I appreciate that. Um, and we'll keep going. Mr. President, that's all we have on our news. Thank you, Chairman Daney. Next item we have this evening, Committee of the Whole is on our Police and Health Committee, Chairman Carbonero. Thank you, Mr. President. I do believe we have two items on our agenda tonight that are fall under the category of house cleaning for uh, some ordinances. Is that right, Jim? Fall under the same same category. These are ordinances that are being updated. This is more of a police issue. Oh, sorry. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the first thing we're looking at is uh, an update to Title VI, Chapter 11, 1300 of the uh, Municipal Code, which um, is directed towards stopping, standing, and parking. 
basically it's our parking ordinance um, and it addresses parking violations uh, staff was asked to look at uh, our current fines and fees and um, the internal disruption committee uh, conducted a survey of local um, area towns and found um, our parking fees to be uh, lower than the other surrounding towns um, so they they brought it to the police department and the police department looked at it and said yes our our fees are are low for parking uh, so um, speaking to the chief um, we decided to suggest uh, raising our parking fines and the penalty for um, not non-payment of parking fees uh, within 10 days um, in that I, I worked with um, attorney Brian Mraz to um, look at the whole parking ordinance and bring it up to date um, the ordinance has not been updated for several years. Um, in the last few months, we've had the introduction of passport parking, uh, the metered parking in the last couple of years, and um, we now have a larger percentage of permit parking, and so the parking ordinance needed to be updated. Um, along with the updating, um, we're making a recommendation to uh, raise the fees and um, the penalty for non-payment within 10 days. I don't think we... I have no issue with this whatsoever. Let's move on. Does anybody have any issues with this? this $15 was a bit of a joke. We just move it on to the board? Yes. Yeah. For a vote? Yep. Okay, along those same lines, um, the Internal Disruption Committee asked us to look at um, uh, Village Code Chapter 4 of uh, Title I, which is under general penalty. Um, this is uh, compliance tickets. A uh, compliance ticket is a ticket that an officer can write in lieu of writing an Illinois Vehicle Code uh, violation. Um, the compliance ticket is basically written for um, any type of equipment violation on a vehicle. Um, the fine will be tr paid directly um, to the village um, as opposed to um, someone being uh, given a ticket for current uh, Illinois Vehicle Code violation for a simple um, Illinois Vehicle Code violation is $125. So rather than an officer write a ticket for $125 for, say, expired registration or talking on your cell phone or not wearing your seatbelt, um, the officer has an option of writing a compliance ticket, something that the violator could comply with at the moment or at a later date and pay a fine directly to the village rather than um, the $125 fine um, for an Illinois vehicle code violation. So again, we looked at um, surrounding towns and found um, the village of Bartlett fines to be um, much lower than other towns. So the recommendation would be to raise the fine from 15 to $25 and then an additional penalty if the fine is not paid within 10 days. And the Illinois Vehicle Code has been updated since our ordinance was updated. Um, this would also add some um, compliance violations to the, um, the code. Some of those violations include um, some of the graduated driver's licensing things um, for a number of passengers or passengers not wearing a seatbelt, um, also electronic communication devices or use thereof while you're driving, i.e. cell phones, texting and or talking on the phone to your head while you're driving. Does anybody have any? Oh, go ahead. After you issue the tickets, um, what do we do to collect on them? Um, well, they, they're given an, the compliance tickets are given an envelope, and they have ten days to pay on them. If at ten days they don't pay, the fine would then double. Um, and then, if they're not paid within thirty days, they're given the option um, written into the ordinance now. And correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. They now is written in. Um, we can send them to local adjudication. currently looking into that will be brought to you at a committee meeting, I think the next committee meeting, called ITROP. It's a program with the State of Illinois Comptroller, and it actually lets uh, monies that are delinquent be taken out of their, their tax returns. So that will be brought to you soon, and I think that will <coughs> help a lot. So. Yeah, that's where I was going with my line of questioning, because it's, it's a very effective system. <laughs> uh, it can be labor intensive on the municipal side, um, especially if you have a backlog, but once you get caught up, uh, things start start to change, and uh, for once, the state can actually come in handy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Does anybody else have any issues with that? No. 
Okay, let's move that along. Let's send it on to the board for a vote. Thank you guys for both being here. That's all I have. <clears throat> That I will entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session. Sure. To discuss uh, to pending discuss litigation. Pending or imminent, lit imminent litigation pursuant to Section 2C11 of the Open Meetings Act. Moved by Trustee Kammerer. Second. Seconded by Trustee Ranke. Will the clerk please call the roll. Trustee Kammerer. Yes. Carbonero. Yes. Daney. Yes. Cabrena. Yes. Hopkins. Yes. Ranke. Yeah. We are adjourned.